The way that I ensure our work's high quality is through a rigorous process. It's an ongoing practice where I'm interrogating the similar topics over and over. And then also I have a feedback loop. People see my work and feed back to me, audiences, institutions, and that kind of continues a dialogue. My ambition for the work is always that it pushes boundaries, my boundaries and those of the audience, pushes me to make work that I haven't made before, that challenges me to learn new skills. My artistic ambitions are to have as much a multitude of conversations as possible through my practice, through as many spaces with as many people as possible. When I made Not Dying, I was supported enormously by Kate O'Donnell from Trans Creative, who directed it. And throughout my career, from my first appearance on a stage to staging Not Dying, I have been supported consistently by the Barbican Centre. Some of my ambitions include working with moving image with a greater technical detail, working with crews, specialist individuals on a technical level, but also on a content level. So doing a lot more direction, choreography and arrangement. As a freelance artist, you find yourself supported by different people and institutions at different stages in your career. The institution that supported me throughout all of my practice is the New Art Exchange, where I had my first exhibition and I'm still working with them now. Quality can be about the individuals I choose to work with and definitely their level of experience and what they can bring. So I'm always looking out for people's portfolios. When I'm writing a novel, inclusivity is at the absolute heart of it. I make sure that in the novels that I write that the characters are a fair representation of everybody out there. Disabled people do not appear enough on our bookshelves. An inclusive practice doesn't happen solely at a creative level, but also at a production level. The project management, the employment and the budgeting decisions I'm making which is so important to consider when one is broadening the inclusivity of one's practice. Most of the films that I've made today, almost all of them, um, at least 50% of the, the people working within the films are black women. I want to make work that centres the disabled experience while being open to non-disabled audiences. As well as the art world, I want my mum and dad and my, my family to be able to engage with my work. The way I try to make it relevant to them is make it as culturally specific as possible. The work is also for people with marginal voices, marginal identities to see themselves in cultural institutions, in galleries. My work is for the people that I am embedded with in my community, the disabled community and the community in the North East. So, you know, I, I am very much thinking about my own background. I'm thinking about people from working class or lower working class experiences, people who've experienced poverty. I spend a lot of time thinking about the people who are going to meet with my work and how they're going to meet with it. The language is really important. Often it's non-verbal language, it's objects, shapes, colours, textures, and it's tactile. I kind of use that as a palette of options to think about how I want to connect with people. Having a strategic approach to my freelance career means that every choice I make is assessed on a metric of whether it supports the financial viability of my career and whether it supports my growth as a creative. I'm developing the work, the connections and the projects in line with a broader plan for where I want to be I've thought very much about social media in relation to the potential for connections with people who are watching, people who are engaging, potentially wanting to work with me on, on future projects. It is possible to be strategic. I think it's about planning, it's about prioritising what I want out of my career and also trying to think about how the gallery system works, how the funding system works. I spend time uh, imagining so I will allocate a week at the start of the year, a week part way through the year, just to imaginate, I like to call it, and think about what I want to do. The way that I sustain my practice financially is often through different income streams, from commissions to selling work, 
to teaching or giving talks and it varies year to year in terms of the balance of those things and how much funding I'm applying for from places including the Arts Council. As we go forward there's also NFTs or uh, digital works online in terms of how to use your IP uh, smarter. I think ultimately it's about trying to make sure my income streams have a mix of public and commercial uh, input. Something that's proved particularly successful as a long-term income stream is workshops, finding out my unique selling point and then building those into workshops. I ensure my practice is constantly evolving because I'm always seeking input on it from other people. Whether we're talking about consultants, mentors or audiences, and I want to make sure that every opportunity I take and every project I develop is also developing me and opening me up to new possibilities. Nowadays, I spend less time writing applications and more time in conversations. I'm permanently looking at new ways to find the entrance into something and the new process which leads to a different outcome. My practice is constantly evolving through play. I leave a lot of room and time for process. Not all my projects have an end point or an end product. Sometimes the project is the process itself. I think the climate crisis practically is going to ensure that lots more of the work that I make is in my locality and the way that other people access it is via online to cut down on transport. Increasing city pollution is having a negative impact on my breathing and the worse this gets, the harder it will be for me to perform at the level I want to perform at. I will become increasingly less able perhaps to work in the outside world without access adaptions that I haven't really got answers for at the moment. I recycle a lot of things in my sculptural works, um, you know, like my grandmother's uh, sewing machine here or objects that are from the past that are mining my heritage. I constantly conversate with different organisations about is actually the carbon footprint that is created through travel. Sometimes it's not even necessary to travel to a certain part of the planet, let alone the country, to have a conversation around something since we have technology with the likes of Zoom. Anything that I try and do financially and for the environment is second-hand charity shops, make, do and mend. Also up here we have a really good culture in swapping materials and things. The investment principles are really useful as a springboard into your creative work. You know, I feel that the practice in general is actually meeting up with those principles and I continue to want to strive to do more, to do better with every project. You know, supporting other people in their practices, bringing them in and fostering and creating opportunities, raising the ambition of the work. The investment principles make me answer difficult questions, make me think about whether I'm doing the right thing, whether I'm doing it for the right audiences, whether I'm truly developing and growing, myself, other people or the industry. They seem to be aiming at more fairness and inclusion and accessibility to the arts for everyone. So I think they're useful if the places with power are genuinely um, incorporating those ideas of, of fairness. You can pay lip service to the investment principles or you can think about how you can genuinely deliver them. And that is the difference between ticking a box and forming really meaningful relationships with people, with communities, with each other, with organisations, with your audiences.